great uh, Kentucky 8.30 in the morning. How many people get up this early normally? Yeah, well, so I was going to say how many people would get up here for the new Corvette? Yeah, see? So here we are. Um, you know, normally, yeah, and my name is Buzz, and I'm from California and now Arizona. Uh, I'm on the board, in case you don't know me, but uh, we're here to really celebrate the Corvette, and the Bash has become the biggest event out here at the National Corvette Museum, um, primarily because it's usually an introduction of the new car for next year. The new car's been out since January, so little change up this year so um, I hear there may be another announcement today that uh, might tweak your interest and maybe not but uh, without uh, anything further I'm going to hand it over to Taz Jector the uh, chief engineer of Corvette Um, well, I sure appreciate everybody getting up and coming in. Uh, Buzz is right. Uh, we've already introduced the, the 19 uh, model year. Um, but it's been a really busy year, and uh, Harl and I are going to go through uh, a bunch of things that we've been through and stuff you might uh, find interesting. And then uh, we're scheduled for two hours. Uh, we certainly won't talk for two hours, but uh, we'll be able to answer any questions you have uh, at the end. So. We always like this interaction. Uh, we love talking to you guys. A lot of our best ideas come from customers. So that's why we come here and we're super interested in everything you have to say about uh, either the car you own or a car you'd like to own someday. Uh, or, you know, the whole team is here. You see all the people uh, that come down from Michigan and hear from the, the plant as well. Um, basically just to hear uh, what you have to say. So. Uh, like I said, we've had a really exciting year and uh, lots going on, so uh, I'm going to let Harlan go ahead and uh, start uh, a little retrospective and, and get us kicked off. So thanks again for coming. Well, just a couple of things to, to start off with. Hey, did you know that the Corvette is the most loved car in America? Yeah. Well, they do surveys, I guess. People up here, you would know that automatically, but here's proof. Actually, somebody proved it, strategic vision, they do the survey, and Corvette's the most low car in America. And also, when a car and driver's 10 most loved cars, so we'll take that, Corvette, uh, once again, uh, in the car and driver prestigious 10 best award. And how many people were here for the racing banquet last night? Oh, good. So I was, I was uh, honored to be, for, for me to be a part of it. And as you know, we're back-to-back -back manufacturers, driver, team champs. And uh, got off to uh, the start this year. We got finally got our first win at Long Beach. There we have in defense trying to three-peat for, uh, for the championship this year. And the interesting thing, as you know, on the racing side, we compete with a lot of the same cars we compete with in the showroom. And the showroom, once again, we're also champions with over 40% of what we call the luxury sports car segment Corvette owns, and that's thanks to all of you and all your friends buying Corvettes. And we're just really uh, doing even even better in the showroom than on the racetrack, believe it or not, in, in beating the competition. Uh, one of the things uh, I'd like to go over, a lot of people like to see the data, one of the things just uh, the carbon edition we did for 2018 that we showed here last year. Uh, we did all the 650 that, that we that we said we were going to do, and, and people snapped them up. It was it's a really special car, and it was a very successful uh, special edition uh, for 65 years of Corvette and all the carbon components which uh, we celebrate. Now um, here's how we're doing so far for 2019 model year. Already got some returns. You know the first 7,000 cars ordered for 2019. And interesting, the Grand Sport, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, 30% Grand Sport now past Stingray is the most popular uh, Corvette model. Uh, you look at the different um, models, you know, the Stingray, the 1LT is, be is becoming popular, and this is uh, uh, really good for us as full, you know, 
he can get into a Corvette for not a lot of money. And, and, and what a great car. Now we've upgraded the wheels. There's a lot of wheel options on the Stingray uh, with the 19s and 20s. On the Grand Sport, the 2LT is the most popular. Uh, historically, in the Z06, the 3LZ has been most popular. It's getting a little bit more 2 as the ZR1 comes out. And, of course, the ZR1, um, we have just the two packages. And, of course, the, uh, the Highline package is very popular. And just a few highlights. We have all this data on the different models. Um, one thing is the uh, eight-speed uh, paddle shift continues to keep going up around over 80%. The uh, wheels, again, we have all these wheel options available for the Stingray. The one that Doug Feehan was talking about, his new Stingray uh, that he just bought recently, oddly enough, the, one, the wheels that he got are the silver ones in the corner, and it didn't even show up. To, so he's a pretty rare guy. You know, we got one that didn't even get to a full percent. But uh, if you want to be like Feehan, you can use people buy those wheels. So you bought the Feehan wheels. On the, uh, the Grand Sport, again, the, uh, the Heritage package with the stripes continues to be uh, pretty popular as well. Red brakes, black wheels are the most popular wheel color. I just sit through here too. Z06. Uh, Z06 continues to do well. A lot of people are saying, well, isn't the Z01 going to hurt the Z06? Actually, uh, we saw this last time. A lot of people come in to see the Z01, and then they may decide, you know what, I can get a Z06 today and not have to wait, and it's a great car. So it actually helps the Z06 a little bit. still doing uh, very well with the Z06. Competition seats always do well for Z06. And then we even have some early ZR1. Uh, stuff like 69% uh, are getting the ZTK package with the high wing and the uh, and, uh, more aggressive chassis. We're gonna, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The other thing, incredibly, the ZLC, that's our, uh, like the car we have here, right here, the Sebring Orange design package. We'll talk about the details of that in a few minutes. 37% uh, of the uh, zero ones, people are checking the box for that package. And so far, the carbon flash wheels are the most uh, popular. And again, uh, close to 80% um, paddle shift, eight speed. And here's the colors. Everybody's always excited about colors. Uh, Arctic white, uh, every year, the, since actually every year since 2013 has been the most popular Corvette color. And black <laughs> always does well towards red. Gray is doing well. And then look at the orange, 12%, uh, fifth place for, for orange, uh, Sebring orange. And we talked about a little bit you know, how we come to the, the bash and the Corvette event, and you guys kept saying, we want a bright orange. This gentleman with the orange shirt, he bugged me for a while on it. So we finally got the bright orange, and he was right. Look how great it's doing. So let's get into uh, some new stuff for 2019. And for, you know, obviously the Zebra One is saying there's a couple other little changes, small but significant things. Uh, uh, as we said, we actually, as Buzz said, we actually have been building 2019 cars since January 29th. Zero One started in March. Um, we brought back the, the engine build program for Zero One and Zero Six. So if you want to uh, build your own engine, it's a great, it's a great like fantasy camp type activity that's available. And the other thing, uh, 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 not insignificant, is to switch to over to Zero W40 oil. And this is a uh, a great move because um, now you don't have, you can use that same oil for both street and track use. You don't have to do the, the oil change if you're going to go to the track uh, on all the cars. It's good for both usages. It's also backwards compatible to 2014 Corvettes and also forward. If you don't have the 040, you're not going to the track. You can still use the 530 as well, so you can go either way. But it's a great uh, achievement from uh, our friends at Mobile One to upgrade the uh, oil to be uh, dual purpose. So that's exciting. And there's some uh, accessory news, performance. A lot of people are asking for performance upgrades. We came out with this new, this is available now. You can order it uh, um, as a dealer install option with your car or get it as an accessory. It's the new performance intake. First of all, it looks pretty cool. You got the Jake. We have the Jake on the uh, on the air intake and things like that. But the key, the key things about it with a ZR1 at 17 horsepower makes it 772, and a uh, Z06 adds 11 horsepower. You know, gets you to 661. So it actually has a good performance uh, benefit. It's 50 state legal. 
It even comes with the label. Uh, so it's a neat uh, performance. It, it comes with the warranty also. So it's a nice upgrade, especially for Z06 and uh, Zero Ones. Okay, uh, this is also a thing. This is something we also heard from uh, you guys coming to us. We, we always come every year and give a list of all the, the details and improvements we do year to year. And the first thing people say, well, I just got a car. My car's one year old, two year old. What of these app upgrades can I add to my car? And nine out of 10 times we say, well, we're sorry, but you know, it's not backwards compatible with electronics, whatever, you have to get a new car. But this one, uh, which is really cool, if you have magnetic ride control, we're actually making the newer calibrations uh, available so that you can upgrade. Anybody, anybody in here done this to upgrade it? You guys, and, and a few people I've talked to, everybody says it's a great upgrade, they notice it right away. And it's basically available on uh, all the Corvettes with magnetic ride control. So. Uh, the FE2 Stingray, the Z51, which if you have magnetic ride, the Grand Sports, the Z06s, um, they're, they're available in upgrades. And there's two different kits. Some of you can either get the full one, or some, or we actually made one available that leaves the track mode alone. The reason we did that in case uh, somebody, people have liked the track mode the way that it is, they do, they've done maybe modifications, they don't want to touch the track mode, you can get it that way too, or you can get the new track mode calibration as well. So it's something to look into if you want to upgrade your magnetic ride. And another one we've done, we, we, we actually came out with these um, carbon flash rockers for the uh, 2017 Grand Sport and Z06, and they're now available if you have Stingray. It's a nice add to, uh, it's both aero, and then the main thing too is uh, reduces stone chips and things like that. And it's less expensive than getting the carbon fiber versions. So that's, that's available now too. All right. So let's talk about the ZR1. Now, as you know, this isn't the first time we've done a Corvette ZR1. ZR1 has a great history and heritage for Corvette. And actually, the first ZR1 uh, is one that maybe a lot of people may not remember or know about. Uh, actually, it started as a lot of the Corvette names start as an RPO code, you know, for a, for a performance package. This was very um, heavy duty package for an LT1 engine, uh, 1970 to 72 Corvettes. All of those three years, only 53 were made. And uh, had you know, some hardcore stuff, no air conditioning, power windows, no ste power steering, no radio. So it's really a hardcore track package. And it cost $1,010.50. So I could learn something from the, the guys back then. They used to use the sense. Yeah, it's more money than I'm leaving on the table. I should add 50 cents to every option. They were smart back then. But anyway. Of course, the 1990 ZR1 um, really brought the Corvette into the full supercar status. You know, with the LT5 engine, came out 375 horsepower, went up to 405. Uh, in 1990, it came out 58,995. It was a lot of money back then, but really competed with cars that were more expensive. Had pretty wide tires, even by today's standards, 315. And we made almost 7,000 of those over its uh, basically six model year run that we had. Then ZR1 returned in 2009. It was the first supercharged Corvette and uh, 638 horsepower. And the uh, first Corvette that cost over $100,000. And, uh, and there's a lot of Corvette firsts in this car, and a lot of the things that we did on this car have translated to the, the models across the range. You know, the carbon fiber components, carbon fiber hood, carbon fiber roof, the carbon ceramic brakes from Brembo, the Michelin tires from the first, this is the first production Corvette with the Michelin tires. We had the unique hood window. 19s and 20s, first Corvette with 19 inch front, 20 inch rear. We thought that was so outrageous. Now that's our standard size wheels on the Stingray. But, um, Great car, and we'll get it off to the new 2019 Corvette ZR1. I'll let Taj uh, come up and tell you more about that. After the break. I've been celebrating 65 years of incredible performance. 
Nothing makes the heart beat faster than a Corvette. It was the first generation launched in 1953. The Corvette has symbolized sports car excellence. It's time for the return of another legendary Corvette name. This is the fastest, most powerful Corvette ever created. Introducing the 2019 Corvette ER1. LT5 6.2 liter supercharged VA produces an SAE certified 755 horsepower and 750 foot pounds of torque. The ZR1 will hit a top speed of 212 miles per hour. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the fastest, most powerful Corvette convertible ever the 2019 Corvette ZR1 convertible. So these two amazing Corvette ZR1s epitomize a strong alliance between design and engineering. Our team's effort has created the finest Corvettes in our history. And what this car represents is a real collaborative effort, a combination of what we learned from racing. This is a very serious machine in terms of what it's capable of doing, but also it's a wonderful piece of dynamic art. So I've seen the evolution of the fifth generation, sixth generation, seventh generation, and now the highlight of the seventh generation, the ZR1. So we're really, really happy and really, really proud we're able to do one and do one that really does justice to the ZR1 name. It was, uh, it was awesome. It was really fun to uh, introduce this car first at Dubai, uh, and then that, that video was taken from LA. Um, so it really is uh, a global brand. People really appreciate uh, the Corvette all around the world. A lot of people were scratching their head, why Dubai? Uh, well, the Middle East, there's a lot of rich people there. Uh, it's becoming a bigger and bigger uh, part of our market. Um, it could be much bigger. Um, the customers there are a lot like you guys, except about 30 years younger. They're, uh, <laughs> some of you 20 years younger. But uh, they're super knowledgeable, super passionate about the brand. Um, they have a lot of disposable income. They typically own a bunch of cars. Uh, but they are really excited about Corvettes. And so, uh, you know, we introduced the, the Grand Sport in Geneva. Um, Another part of our global footprint, uh, making an impression on the world uh, with the car. And then in LA, the timing worked out perfect for the North American debut. Uh, you saw Mark Royce, uh, he's head of all product development uh, in General Motors. He's very passionate about Corvette and all performance, uh, including Camaro and D-Series Cadillacs. Very passionate about uh, performance. He actually uh, did this one week after hip surgery. Uh, he was so uh, passionate about getting out there, introducing the car, being part of it. Uh, most people wouldn't even be back to work. Here he is flying across the country uh, and almost needed help getting up onto the stage uh, to be part of the reveal. But that's the kind of commitment and passion that he has. So um, yeah, the ZR1's obviously uh, big news. Um, you saw the, the orange car. We actually have an orange car in here uh, in convertible form. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's been quite a media blitz. Uh, you see the ZR1 everywhere uh, being talked about. Uh, I'll go through some of the, a little more of the details just to make sure everybody's uh, familiar with exactly what's going on here. So the LT5, uh, we use the same RPO, Harlan uh, described that. RPO stands for Regular Production Option. So that's just a code that lets the, the whole manufacturing system know what the components need to flow to that vehicle. Um, so the LT5 engine, 755 horsepower, 715 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, that's just as important as the horsepower number. Broadband horsepower, you, you find it in every uh, part of the, the tack. 
212 mile an hour top speed. I'm gonna show you uh, a video of, of that run uh, that we did in Germany. A dual in fuel injection, so both direct injection, which our other uh, Corvettes have been adding port injection uh, at high engine uh, speed and high horsepower. Just to get enough fuel in the engine, we had to add a second system to deliver that fuel. Um, next thing is uh, the transmissions. Um, this is another example where we listened to you guys, um, the last gen, C6. We did Z06 and Z01 in manual transmission uh, only. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, well, I can't buy the Z06, can't buy the Z01 uh, because my spouse, whoever that might be, um, doesn't really want to drive a stick all the time. We have to have an automatic, so we bought a Grand Sport. They really would like the extra performance to get that uh, engine in the higher level car. And so uh, we really listened to that and wanted to make sure that this time around, both for Z06 and for ZR1, uh, we offer both transmissions. So the, the seven speed with the rev match, which um, we just had a journalist uh, review. You probably saw a bunch of the media uh, hype around it. We showed the car road Atlanta. And I was amazed, uh, the journalists usually are super prideful about their driving skill and the ability to do um, uh, heel toe downshifts. Almost all of them just put the rev match on uh, now. So that is becoming uh, kind of pervasive. Everybody kind of expects it. And the performance of that system has gotten better that even pro drivers will use it because you cannot do better uh, than it. Uh, so the standard chassis, uh, as on the last uh, ZR1, we have a magnetic ride, uh, ELSD, which is uh, new for this generation, ceramic brakes, first time on a Corvette and C6, uh, again, standard on the car here. And, um, you know, we have Brembo uh, come to many of our events to talk about the collaboration that we have between uh, General Motors Corvette and, and Brembo. And they're really happy uh, that they partnered with us because we've actually pushed uh, their technology in a direction to make it more everyday useful. Uh, when the C6 ZR1 came out, ceramics were very exotic. Uh, they came only on really high-end cars or expensive options on high-end cars. And they were kind of track-oriented. And so all anybody cared about was track performance. Nobody cared about you know, how easy it's to modulate when they're cold, you know, whether they feel like in daily driving when they're cold, um, do they make noise? A lot of them were really noisy systems back then because you didn't care about that on the track. And we actually pushed Brembo and the technology in the direction to make it uh, everyday useful in addition to uh, the ability to perform really well on the track. The standard car, uh, obviously, have the Michelin tires. The tires are the same uh, sizes as on the, the Z06. Uh, the standard car comes with the lower drag spoiler, so that's the low spoiler. That's actually no higher than the, the uh, Z06 uh, wicker uh, rear spoiler system. We wanted to have a uh, you know, hardcore track version, at least recently, you know, the best arrow we could. But because the arrow aids have to be directly tied into the body structure, they can't be attached to the hatch like you see on a lot of cars. When you open the hatch, the spoiler goes up with it. There's so much load on that thing, it would actually press the hatch down into the body work, compress the seals, and it would actually change the attitude of the wing, which you cannot have uh, on the track. It would make the car unstable. So we have to tie it directly into the structure, and that means the wing stays in place when you open the hatch or the deck lid uh, on the convertible. And so it's pretty hard if you can check the cars out out here. It makes lo loading luggage or the removal roof uh, makes it more difficult to load over that wing. So we want to make sure if somebody wanted all the horsepower chassis and everything uh, on the ZR1, but still want to use it as an everyday car, um, we put the low wing in there to, to be a more all around easier car to use. So that's the standard condition. And then Harlan mentioned the ZTK, which like 60% of the people, uh, 69, almost 70% of the people are requesting, um, it certainly makes the car visible from a long way away, you can tell, okay, that's the ZR1. Um, spoilers up nice and high, uh, that's the best you see it on race cars, the spoilers are high, up in the clean air. Uh, it's nice because it's so high you can't see it in the rear view mirror, uh, you actually see under it, uh, which is a, a nice feature, so in that way it's, it's actually better than the low wing car. Um, you get the cup tires. And uh, you get, uh, on the zero one I, I mentioned the brakes, uh, we put uh, hybrid racing pads uh, at all four corners. 
and then we put a uh, special version, even though it looks the same, it's a special version on the front rotors. Um, it actually bakes longer uh, in the oven at Brembo. Uh, these things take like a week to make a set of rotors, a uh, very special process, and it takes even longer uh, if you bake them, it actually puts more silicone in the rotor and that helps with heat resistance and um, that makes the car more robust on the track. Uh, I mentioned the engine, a lot of uh, content changes in the engine. Wanted to make sure uh, it didn't only make a lot of horsepower, but it would do so uh, for the life of the car, either on the street or on the track. Um, we actually had to, uh, we work with Eaton as we have before. This is one of their biggest uh, superchargers. Very challenging to package it uh, under the hood. We actually had to invent a new throttle body. We found it for the first time that a restriction, you know, it's basically a pump. You're trying to uh, take air through the engine. And we found that even though we were using the biggest uh, throttle body General Motors and our suppliers had, it was still a bit of a restriction. So we had to tool up a new one uh, from scratch. Uh, it's almost 100 millimeters, 95 millimeters in diameter. It's almost four inches around how big this uh, throttle is. Uh, had to do new control systems, uh, redo the lube uh, and vent, that's for our oil <laughs> manager, make sure the car lubes itself well uh, on the track. And then uh, we had to do a um, special version of the hood, which you've probably seen out here, to actually surround the engine because it comes up right through the hood. And all the engines will be built right over here uh, in the plant at the Performance Build Center. So all these will be hand built. Here's a little more detail uh, on the supercharger. You can see it's actually uh, three inches, 73 millimeters is three inches taller than the LT4. Uh, also quite a bit taller than the LS9 that we had in the sixth generation car. The reason why height is good is that you can, first of all, the blower itself is bigger, so that takes up more room. But you also have the heat exchangers for the intercooler as you go up, you can make those bigger, which means you're taking more heat out of the intake charge. Cooler air into the cylinders means more power. And then it also improves the flow path. The higher it is, the longer the flow has to get through the, the uh, heat exchangers, mixed properly, and goes through the ports. If that whole system is set up higher, you can get a more even distribution uh, into all cylinders, which really helps us out. The, uh, when you look at the hood, you know, that's one of the big challenges we had was how do you do this giant engine in a car with a very low seating position and a very low roof? You don't want the engine to obscure all your view forward, so we wanted to keep it as low as possible. If you remember on the C6 ZR1, we pushed the engine all the way up to the underside of the hood. We eliminated the inner panel on the hood. We eliminated the hood blanket, and we just put that little uh, polycarbonate window in. Uh, so that you could see the engine through there. Um, we spent a fortune dressing up the engine. You know, we actually used the cast aluminum uh, intercooler cover, and then we uh, polished it, and we painted it, and we clear coated it to make it look as good as we could. And a lot of people thought it was fake. A lot of people actually thought it was a piece of plastic because it looked so perfect. Um, and this time around, we said, well, okay, that wasn't the most successful. We actually need more room, more vertical room, so we said, well, why don't we take the engine right up through the hood? Um, Callaway does that. Uh, you can see the engine. But we didn't want it to have just this sort of crude machinery coming up through the engine or through the hood. So we said, why don't we just do the whole intercooler cover in carbon and then have the carbon hood, which surrounds it, also be carbon. We create a racing stripe uh, look with the ability to have the engine uh, coming right up through. So, a lot of people are really surprised when they look at the car with the hood closed. It looks like what we call our B92 package, which is exposed carbon racing stripe on the hood. But when you open the hood, you can see it. No, the hood is just a halo around the engine. And the, this engine cover stays put with the uh, engine, and the rest of the hood goes up. So it's kind of a trick a solution. It looks really good, and it works really well in terms of getting uh, the proper packaging. So the bottom line is, you know, performance, horsepower, torque, I mentioned the numbers. So here's a, a walk-up chart starting with the LT1. So uh, 460 horsepower, 465 foot-pounds of torque, 
certainly no slouch. Uh, it's a hell of an engine, and uh, everybody has one. It's very happy with it. Then we, we brought out the LT4, and Z06, big step up, uh, supercharged engine. You can see 650 foot-pounds of torque, 650 horsepower, so very, very uh, much bigger than the LT1. In fact, super surpassing what we've done on the LS9 in the last generation. And then here's the uh, LT5. And what's important here is to see that the torque curve is everywhere higher. Uh, a lot of times when you go up in power, you end up with a very peaky engine. You get uh, the torque curve staying high, just right at the end, which pushes the horsepower curve up. And so that's the only place you'll feel it, is when you wind it out. That's not the case uh, with this engine. It has a lot more torque across the band. And it doesn't look like a lot here, but if you look at the scale, it actually starts at zero, and each of these increments is 200 foot-pounds, which is an enormous scale. So even though this doesn't look very big, you know, that is like 100 foot-pounds uh, right there, that difference. And that's a difference you can really feel. And uh, this engine is so awesome because every gear feels really powerful. There are no bad gears, and then you pick one, you put hit the throttle and you go. It's just amazing uh, the amount of torque you have on hand. Just for uh, interest, we also put the what Harlan mentioned. Here's the, the predecessor, LT5, and you can see how far we've come. So the king of the hill uh, back in the 90s, uh, ZR1, that's way down here, way below the <coughs> standard offering today at 375 horsepower. So you can see how technology has really moved and now we're all the beneficiaries of that. Big uh, important thing on this car was to manage the cooling, make sure that it was uh, cooling well at all temperatures on the track. So that's a big reason the car looks the way it does. The, uh, we crammed as much cooling content in, in this car as we could. So it has everything from the Z06, plus a bunch of outboard cooling content. So additional air cooler, each one of these outboard modules that see, you see here has two coolers in it. It has uh, what we call a low temperature. That's actually the inner cooler, uh, cooler, and then additional radiator, so engine coolant cooling. So you actually have three across for both the inner cooler and the radiator. Uh, so we spent a lot of time in the wind tunnel making sure that these, the biggest heat exchangers we could package in the car got really good airflow, and so the, the car cools uh, up to 100 degrees now full tank of fuel, pro driver, um, the car will keep cool, whether it's a manual or automatic. This is computational fluid dynamics, and these flow lines are not all the flow lines that go around the car. These are only the flow lines that go through a heat exchanger uh, of one sort or another. So you can see the, the ones in blue uh, go through the center section, and they go either under the car, or we have the functional hood openings that go over the top of the car which helps power the rear wing. You can see the new outboard ones, these are in yellow. Uh, they come through the outboard ones. And then these green ones that you see here, those are the flow lines that go all the way to the back of the car and go through the quarter inlets here where we have the uh, trans and dip cooler uh, as we've had on other cars. So the important thing to see is we're not drawing air that cools one component into another. You want fresh, clean air going into all heat exchangers. So that's really important when you're designing the geometry, the, the style of the exterior of the car. You need to make sure each heat exchanger gets perfectly good ambient air. So that's why the front end of this car looks the way it does. Um, you know, this, the, the, what people call the, the bumper cover or the front fascia, uh, typically uh, doesn't have this much opening. You can see just from the look of the car that it consists almost entirely of functional openings all the way across. The only part that isn't openings is where we actually have to have the energy absorbing material behind it uh, for the bumper. And we have, still have to meet all the, the bumper hip requirements. But we've gone so far as to take the structural element behind that uh, bumper energy absorber and we cord it out in multiple locations. Uh, actually four big holes, so it actually breathes through the, the bumper structure in addition to uh, around it and below it. Need to be stalled out here. Okay.
Okay, I mentioned arrow, super important. Um, the front, the, the rear wing gets uh, all the attention, and when we first introduced this car, uh, we said it has 950 pounds of downforce uh, at top speed, and uh, people kind of interpreted that as that the wing does that. The wing is just part of an overall solution. It's the one you can see most visibly, uh, but it's really part of an overall aerodynamic package. Uh, you can see um, on the right here, you can see the underside of the uh, underside of the wing above the rear fascia. You can see these flow lines. Uh, that's important because it's actually the underside of the wing that's important. A lot of people think of the top of the wing, you know, it points down, the air kind of bounces off and pushes it down in the car. That's not really the way it works. You get a little bit out of that, but most of it is the air accelerates underneath the wing and that creates low pressure on the bottom of the wing and that is what helps draw the car down. And there's actually a very important feature that you don't really notice unless you look at the car closely, and that's the little spoiler, the little pickup on the rear fascia. That works in conjunction with the wing to actually create uh, what we call a venturi. Uh, a venturi is where air accelerates through a narrow passage, and when air moves fast, that creates low pressure, and so that's what helps uh, that rear wing be so effective. It doesn't do any good to nail the back end of the car and not be able to have downforce on the front of the car. You'll just get a car that understeers. The back end will be planted and the front will wash out. So you have to balance front to rear. And the way we did this was to take uh, a technology and execution right off the race car. If you look at the car from a distance, it looks like we have a conventional splitter. Um, the panel that sticks out under the chin. And the way that works is if there's high pressure above it as you're moving through the air. That high pressure acts in all directions and it pushes down on the splitter. Um, that gets you some front downforce, uh, but traditionally we've used flat belly pans uh, underneath that. Uh, it's really good for drag, but what the race team does is they have an upside down wing and the splitter is just the tail of that wing, and then there's a section that looks like an airfoil. Uh, they call it an underwing, because uh, that's exactly what it is. And in this picture, red is high pressure, so we're looking at the car upside down, so above the splitter, that's the high pressure that I was talking about. Underneath this whole area of green here, that's low pressure. And so that's the front of the car pulling down and that's what balances uh, with the rear wing to create a car that has um, very, very good downforce uh, for a street car. Um, I mentioned we were at Road Atlanta last week and we let the journalists drive uh, Grand Sports, Z06s, uh, and ZR1 to kind of move up the performance uh, scale. And they were actually testing uh, our claims. Uh, there's a big sweeping turn that's relatively high speed. And uh, they were trying to see exactly what the speed differential was between a Grand Sport and a ZR1, because it's not a powered corner. You know, engine uh, power does nothing for you. Just It's kind of a constant radius turn. And they were able to go through the same corner 10 miles an hour faster uh, in a ZR1 than in a Z06 in transport, all due to arrow because the tires are the same. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty impressive mm -hmm. demo uh, of the capability. So I've gone through, I've talked about uh, a bunch of these um, uh, new content items uh, for the ZR1. This is the most carbon fiber uh, we've ever put on a car. Uh, Corvette actually kind of pioneered the use of carbon fiber on the, the mainstream cars. I don't know how many of you remember, we did a special edition right at the end of C5 on the Z06 where we did a carbon fiber hood for the first time. We did 2,000 uh, units and that was our first step into it. Now we have carbon all over the car and we've actually elevated the volume of carbon fiber globally uh, to a much higher benchmark than it had ever been before. So if you walk around the car, you can see uh, a lot of the carbon both on the exterior and on the interior. Uh, this car, of course, gets unique wheels, uh, four finishes, pearl, nickel, carbon flash, satin graphite, and chrome. Um, I didn't mention it, but the, the one big difference, even though the tires are same, the front wheels are actually a half inch wider, uh, and that's to stiffen the sidewalls of the front. There's a little more weight with all those heat exchangers on the nose of the car. Uh, with the bigger supercharger. Car weighs about 60 pounds uh, more than a Z06. A lot of that weight's on the front, so for steel
steering response for a really crisp turn in. We wanted to stiffen up the sidewalls, and we did that just by taking the wheel width out a half an inch. This is actually a picture of the clays. This is, you know, you guys can hear from our design folks, Kirk Bennett or Tom Peters. They, they have to do the car, you know, in math, in a design space, or in clay, where they sculpt it. Uh, so these are some of the pictures of the final form uh, of the car as it was being developed. So that's not a real car. Uh, that's a clay car uh, with what we call Dynock. It's like a foil wrap to give it a body color, typically done in silver. Uh, so here's on the patio a design of the final buy-off property for what the car was going to look like. Something. Okay, thank you. So here's the rear end view. You can see the, uh, the giant rear wing. You can also see we, we thought we might put the badge out on the corner. That's the main difference from what you see in this picture. The ZR1 badge is shown here in the corner. It actually ended up being on the center of the car. Uh, I mentioned the hood and the carbon parts. Here's a picture of the hood. I see that we've got hoods out here open so you can look at it uh, close up. Uh, it was very popular at our, uh, our press event. All the journalists uh, like to go up and stick their head through the hood and get somebody to take their picture, just like a little kids at an amusement park. <laughs> uh, we have uh, the rear quarter inlet duct is carbon. Uh, the wings, whether they're low or high or carbon, I've been asked. Um, how heavy is that thing? You need two people, to, if you want to take that wing off or replace the high with the low, which we do not recommend. The car's perfectly balanced as we ship it uh, from the plant. Uh, but these things are incredibly light. You can hold the big wing up with one hand. It's hollow, uh, total carbon construction all the way through the wing and the end plates. Uh, it's built just like a race car, except it's beautiful. Um, that's an example of where, uh, if you ask a, a an engineer, a pure engineer, to design a wing for you, it looks a lot like a, a two by eight. It's dead straight, has a constant section of optimal um, wing airfoil shape, and it looks boring as hell. Um, so the rest of the car is pretty exciting, um, and we want to do more than just have a functional wing. We also want to have a beautiful wing. And so this is an example of where design and engineering work really close together with the race team uh, to try to create a wing that has 100% of the functionality that it needs, but also has a design language that matches the rest of the car. All over, everywhere you look, carbon fiber. Uh, this picture shows the difference between the low wing and the high wing, if you look at the back of the car shows the difference in height. And we've got cars out here, you can see they're, they're quite different. Interior, um, car comes two ways. So if you want to be super hardcore, all you care about is track work. You can still get a 1ZR uh, standard car, or you can get it all loaded up, 3ZR, comes in all interior colors, uh, has a specific interior plaque, uh, model IDs all over, cluster IDs. Um, when you get the 3ZR, you get a carbon fiber uh, wheel rim. We've used accents of carbon before. Now we have big areas of carbon top and bottom, and the grip portions are uh, either in leather or suede. Uh, it's a really nice steering wheel. Uh, one thing I've noticed that's really cool about it is that the carbon fiber is 100% cleanable. So if you think your hands have some lotion or something on it, you can actually grip the wheel in the carbon areas. There's lots of places you can grip it, and you don't have to worry about getting lotion in your suede or on your leather. I never thought of that as being a reason to have this, but it, actually driving down here for a long drive, it's like, it's pretty nice. I can grab it here, and I don't have to worry about getting my suede messed up. Sebring Orange, we've got a car back here in this uh, Sebring Orange design package. Uh, Harlan talked about it, uh, a lot of requests for orange uh, over the years, and so we uh, did a special version for this car. It includes that Sebring orange paint, uh, black badges, uh, orange paint stripes on the carbon uh, rockers and splitters, so it uses the same rockers and splitters, but what we do is we mask and paint the orange first, and then we clear coat the whole thing, so it's not decals, it's painted under the clear coat, which is the best and most expensive uh, way to do it. So 
I was always thinking that uh, clear-coated carbon was the most expensive construction you could ever imagine. Well, our designers are hard at work thinking of more expensive ways to do it. <laughs> Putting, you know, to, you know, accent stripes on clear-coated carbon pieces is the solution to that problem. Uh, or oh, color comes with orange seat belts, uh, brake calipers that match the accent stripes, carbon flash wheels. You can get the hood uh, graphics. Um, and the black uh, hood graphic, you can't see it on the convertible, but on the coupe you can see it extends the black graphic all the way from the windshield to the, the back window. Special floor mats, uh, these are pretty nice looking floor mats. And then a bronze interior aluminum trim that um, isn't the plain brushed aluminum, it gives it a little warmer, uh, a little slightly towards orange uh, tint, bronze. And you get it on all the accent pieces in the interior of the car as well as the backs of the seats. The whole back of the seat is that color. So it's, it's kind of a nice whole package that goes well together. There's a picture of the interior. You can't really see the backs of the seats, uh, but we have cars out here that you can check out. Okay, pricing. We've announced the pricing a long time ago. 120 basically, and Harlan's going to change it to uh, 119, 995, 50. <laughs> with an additional 50 cents. You've got to fund our retirement somehow. Somehow, yeah. Um, three ZR, you see, it's uh, 130. So these are expensive, and I've had people come up to me and say, you know, why are you pricing it so much more than the ZR1 before? Well, actually, if you take the rate of inflation, which has been between 2 and 3% since 2008, it's exactly the same price uh, as it was uh, when we introduced the C6 uh, ZR1. Uh, ZPK, running 70%, we're probably not charging enough for it, only $3,000, so. Maybe we should up the price on that one, so that's why it's really good to come to these events and hear you guys advocating for more expensive packages. <laughs> um, and then I, I mentioned the, the Sebring Orange, that's ZLZ, uh, that's 7,000, includes all the content uh, I went through. And as, you know, like the last time, um, when you buy a ZR1, you don't just get a coupon for a discount to the Ron Fellows Driving School, you get the whole driving school paid for. So. Anybody who buys it should definitely take advantage of that. It's a fantastic experience. that number. Uh, we don't do that. We do more of an SAE procedure where we do a flying mile 
in both directions, so you cancel out uh, any of those effects, and that's why we're uh, 212 miles an hour. I don't know if you notice the exact numbers on there, but if you average those two, it actually comes out to 212.49. So we missed by one hundredth of getting to 213, but we like 212 because that's the boiling point of water. It's easy, it's easy, to, easy to remember. Uh, I should mention also that the car is actually speed limited. Um, so there's a governor on it at 215. Um, and I suspect somebody will find a workaround in the aftermarket. The reason we, uh, we limit it to that is because we haven't done tire testing. When we did our early predictions of how fast this car would go, we didn't think it would go this fast, to be perfectly honest. Um, so Michelin hasn't, we don't want to have them spend the resources to go do a bunch of tire testing, which is pretty elaborate, because you can imagine running a, a tire for extended velocity at um, you know 220 or 225, whatever you decide you want the limit to be. So uh, we decided, well, you know, anything over 215, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've seen a lot, you know, this car obviously is a, a media darling in many ways. Uh, covers of many magazines, uh, lots of people uh, talking about it. Um, we had an interesting situation uh, occur in January, so you notice the date on here, January 25th uh, of this year. Uh, you don't hear us talking about the competitors very often. Um, but in this case, the Ford uh, GT uh, was taken to uh, BIR, where lightning lap is conducted by a uh, car and driver uh, every year. A uh, car and driver finally got their hands uh, on a Ford GT to do a real world test, and they managed to get it on the track uh, at BIR. And they broke their uh, personal track record with uh, Porsche 918. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but that's like a million dollar Supercar. That car is so expensive, you get a Porsche Turbo for free when you buy it. In addition to the 918. So it's a super expensive car, and it held the record uh, at VIR for a long time in car drivers' hands. Um, they took the GT there and, uh, and broke that record uh, with a 243 uh, lap time. So they were talking about how fantastic this car is, unbelievable. And then uh, they put a Pro Driver uh, in it. And it says, at a recent run, BIR, the Ford GT destroyed other times if you come the new record holder with a 238.6 lap. So far uh, superior to what uh, the writers at Car and Driver were able to And their turn's only half a million instead of a full million. Yeah, that's only a half a million if you, if you can get on the list. Um, <clears throat> so that actually came out of a tweet uh, from the driver saying, I did 238.6, I've lowered the track record. Uh, so that was on the 25th of January. Uh, unfortunately for them, um, <laughs> six days later, we were there uh, doing our uh, durability testing. Um, not intending to go run fast laps or anything. We, we actually went there because we've talked about it here a lot. We do 24 hours at race speed to do a final validation. So we take a car with all our production calibrations, we take it to a track, and we accumulate 24 hours uh, as nonstop as we can. So drivers need brakes, you have to replace tires, you have to fill with gas. Um, you have to do all the regular maintenance things, but we want to make sure uh, nothing breaks, because this represents uh, a lifetime of track uh, usage. So it's a big undertaking, a huge deal for us. And because of the launch timing of this car, we weren't able to do it where we usually do it in Michigan at our own course. So we had to rent VIR uh, to do it, and so we were running a variety of course setups uh, there, and um, we accidentally broke the record. <laughs> it just happened. Um, so yeah, Jim Mayer was out uh, doing some of this validation. We ran the same course that they ran on, and we ran 237.5. So six days later, we broke their record by 1.4 seconds, and so, they had the shortest lived uh, record <laughs> in history. And that's kind of kept going. Almost everywhere we take in the car, it's somehow or other a uh, broken track record. So it was funny because um, I was told by GM Communications that we got a call from Ford and their counterparts at Ford saying, nice job. You guys couldn't have planned that any better. You couldn't have done it any better. Congratulations. We were like, we didn't plan it. We just happened to be there doing testing, sorry. Um, our car totally stocked because we were validating it uh, completely stocked. So
So it's, it's kind of uh, a testament to how, how good this car really is. So I'm going to show you the video of that. This is the actual PDR video. This isn't something that's been made by a professional production. minutes from the track and he heard about it 
And so we actually asked to come in the day before uh, to see the car, just for his own background. He does his own work. So since he was so close to the track, we were actually in the process of shaking down the cars, getting ready for the media to show up the next day. Um, so he asked me to come over, we let him uh, come over. Um, he agreed to shake down a couple of the cars and put them in a manual, uh, put them in an automatic, and what do you know, he breaks the track record there. Um, set by the Viper ACR, uh, he was, which he helped develop, actually. He was one of the consultants who helped set up the chassis for the Viper ACR. And so uh, he goes out in our automatic, and he didn't break, break it by a lot, but he only had a few laps. Uh, broke it by a tenth of a second. So he was really proud of that. He posted it uh, right away. It was a, a pretty cool experience. So pretty much every track uh, we've been to, we've broken the track record. Uh, here's some of the, the responses uh, from, from people. Uh, so here's car and driver. Um, one of the things we really tried to do, and I didn't know if the journalists would appreciate it given the short window of time they had to drive the car on the street and track, we really tried to not just make it a scary fast car, not just throw a bunch of horsepower at it, and uh, you know, it's just a you know, Z06, but higher level. We really wanted to make the edges of the performance on envelope uh, more accessible to more people. So make the car more benign, easier to drive, more confidence inspiring so you can get closer uh, to those limits so that a lot of people uh, will be able to experience its performance. And if you read through the media, you see a lot of that really came through. Uh, they actually appreciated our efforts in that area, and I think makes it not just a 755 horsepower car, but a car that people can get in and use and take right up, right up to the limit uh, and enjoy it. So here's uh, Mike Sutton. Uh, he, he was uh, down there. He said, the mightiest of C7 Corvettes shines brightest at the edge of its performance envelope. That's exactly what he was talking about, is you can get all the way out there going crazy fast and still feel like you're uh, very, very uh, comfortable. Um, and um, the other thing we, we emphasize is this is, like all the Corvettes we've done, they're well-rounded cars. It's not like it's a pure track machine with the stripped out acoustics and super hard chassis, something that's impossible to live with every day. It's still a well-rounded car. and. Um, it says down here, traction lies with relative ease with which drivers of all sorts can tap into its massive potential with no compromise to its entertainment or livability. So that's not quite true. I was talking about the high wing, get stuff over the high wing. That's a compromise to livability, so I don't want to fool anybody. But in terms of the driving experience, uh, it really is an uh, all-around touring car and daily driver uh, like you've experienced on other Corvettes. Um, this was a young guy uh, from Auto Week. He says, uh, new king of bets breaks all the laws of physics. Uh, it reads like theory, but after driving the 755 horsepower 2019 ZR1, I now know time travel is possible. <laughs> so, uh, for 120 grand, you get a time machine. That's pretty good. Nobody, nobody thought we'd be able to do a time machine for $120,000. Changes in direction are instantaneous. Um, he really appreciated the, uh, what we've done with the exhaust, so there's actually more difference between when it's quiet and when it's loud, and it's not all of a sudden quiet and loud, it's more of a smooth transition because we put a, actually a passive valve inside the muffler that slowly cracks open as you press the throttle, so it's not all or nothing, um, so they really appreciated that. Uh, he says um, it's quiet in tour mode, not relatively quiet, quiet. I don't know what he's been driving, but it's still a Corvette. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a Cadillac, it's not super quiet, but he really appreciated the difference between um, you know, how expressive the exhaust could be and how quiet it could be. Road and track. Uh, how quick is the ultimate Corvette? Really damn quick. Um, Matt Farah wrote this. Um, he came to track. He's quite a good driver. Uh, he spent a lot of time uh, in the car, and I was standing right by the track. Um, and I don't, this is Road to Atlanta. How many people have been to Road to Atlanta? I'm just curious. So you guys know it's not for the mile of heart. It's it's a kind of old school uh, racetrack. Uh, there's real risk 
uh, there. It's a real roller coaster. There's a lot of blind corners. Um, so it's not a place to go and take a high, you know, a supercar or a hypercar and learn the track uh, for the first time. Um, Matt had been there before. Uh, he, he was really eager to get in this car. And I was standing there when he first exited the car. He'd been out for a few laps. He came out and he just stood there. He had a big grin on his face and he said, more car than balls. <laughs> that, was, that was his summation of his experience uh, on the uh, But he went on, you know, he, he wrote a, a long uh, article. Um, he, he says the same thing. The ride, more than anything, impressed me on the road drive. CR1 is a car that front approach angles aside, I can live with every day. So it's similar uh, to other Corvettes. They're low. Um, so don't drive them when there's more than you know six or eight inches of snow. Um, like we had to do that all winter. We did our capture test fleet um, this winter, just because of when the car was being introduced. We got our cars in the fall and got to ride all winter uh, in these things. We put uh, Michelin snow tires, which are available now in our sizes. And uh, actually, it's, it was a ride to ride the car all winter. It was no compromise. It was really fun. Um, so he, he references the Ford GT. Uh, as usual for the segment, there's nothing quite like it. Handily embarrassed the $450,000 Ford GT uh, by accident, so for $140,000. So he, he knew about that. Uh, the ZR1 is everything you want out of the ultimate Corvette to compete with the world at a price nobody can compete with. Bottom line, it is without question the fastest, loudest, craziest, most capable Corvette ever made, which puts it right in the rank for fastest road cars of all time. America, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andy Pilgrim came. You guys remember Andy, right? Um, great guy. Uh, he was uh, great fun to come with, uh, obviously. Uh, he knows the track, he knows fast cars. Um, so he was really interested in uh, keeping him up there. We had winter of all conditions. It was cold the first day, hot the second day. Um, so he was there on a hot day. Uh, he saw 168 uh, miles an hour. I think Randy's time at the end of, I think he was going 172. It was a little cooler um, the day Randy was there. But Andy was still getting to 168. Anybody who's been to Road Atlanta knows 168. That's fast uh, as you come uh, over the top of the hill. Pretty scary. Um, so one of the things he did, um, was at the end of the day when things were winding down it's the hottest part of the day it was about 90 degrees uh, we wanted and he wanted uh, to go out and run essentially a tank of fuel uh, so we put him in an automatic and uh, actually with all the other journalists watching he went out and ran a tank of fuel which i think was about 13 laps uh, very consistent lap times uh, between 130 and 131 so he was um, not trying to go for a qualifying lap, but trying to run continuous, steady laps at a very high pace. Uh, he basically did that uh, with the car, um, not complaining one bit. Um, you know, there's the Z06's reputation for being less than robust on the track in the heat. Um, this car is validated to 100 degrees here. We put Andy in the car uh, to run as hard as he could uh, for a tank, and the car behaved perfectly. One of the reasons we wanted to do that is the way you run these media events, you got a bunch of people buying for car time, and so we typically let them go out three or four laps, then they got to come in, let somebody else have a turn, and so that starts conspiracy theories that, oh, the car can't go more than three laps uh, before having trouble. So that's, that's not it, it's just that we want to get all the journalists through the car and everybody uh, be able to share them. But we thought this time it would be a really good idea to let somebody, at least want somebody Somebody everybody respected uh, that they knew could push a car to its limit, let them go out and run the car hard. Uh, ZR1 never got nervous or twitchy, saw no warning lights. Uh, engine temps remained in the normal range throughout the run. So this, this was a completely stock car. Um, like I said, we've done absolutely the best job. We know how to do cram as much content uh, for tooling into this vehicle. Uh, here's Top Gear, uh, Pat Devereaux. Um, saying, what is the competition to the ZR1? Frankly, there isn't any uh, at this price. Um, compares it to the McLaren. Um, yeah, he was uh, super happy. So Top Gear hasn't always been a huge fan of American cars. 
Uh, but his bottom line is, we should pause for a moment and recognize that America's best supercar for now is the furious Corvette ZR1. And uh, he's, you know, he's, he's referencing how much better the C7 is in general. And you see, saw that in, in some of the other articles that, um, that the, the ZR1 is the pinnacle C7, but you get all the C7 goodness and then you just take it uh, to the extreme in the ZR1. Okay, Harlan mentioned big announcements. Did you mention it? Anyway. All right. This is the only reason most of you are still awake. <laughs> There's a reason this big announcement is such small print. <laughs> so, our news is we're going to pace Indy. Actually, that's noble. That's right. Do you guys do that? Do we know who's going to drive? I know there's been a few people practicing. I volunteer. <laughs> okay, who wants Harlan to drive? Yeah. That, was that was easy. <laughs> How about a pass? It's settled. It's settled, <laughs> yes. Um, Admiral Blue Car, uh, some unique graphics. Um, we like to joke that this is the only pace car in the world that when they drop the flag, it doesn't get off the track, it just accelerates. <laughs> 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 Um, so we're the, we're the closest to being able to do that uh, with the ZR1. <laughs> so here's the really big news. You know how we like to mess with colors. We can't leave them well enough alone. We're always tampering. Um, and so uh, we're going to have a new gray. And we've had a whole series of grays here. Um, but it turns out every time we change them, the penetration goes up. Um, a lot of people are ordering the ZR1. Uh, in the uh, Watkins Glen gray, they think it looks really sinister, but not black. Uh, we actually have samples up here. I think it'll actually improve that sinister I look. Wanna, I gotta say something about the samples. Okay. We got Chuck Valentini here, right. our expert at paint, or charge of paint, the new paint shop, everything that's going great at Bowling Green. And he said, he goes, huh? he goes you can't just show a couple of paint chip, chips at the Corvette Museum with all the most important customers here. That's not good enough. I'm going to bring over some early panels that we painted in the new paint shop. So thanks, Chuck, for doing that. He's my girl. And, uh, so, you want to take it out and hold it up? You want to bring up Chuck? So this this happened while we were presenting. I didn't know we were doing this. So this came together, I guess, at the last minute. So we have two new colors. Uh, one is a shadow gray, replaces Watkins Glen. And uh, Elkhart Lake Blue replaces Admiral Blue. And this breaks my heart, to tell you the truth, because Admiral Blue has been one of my all-time favorites. I've actually been pushing for it to come back. I loved it in the fourth generation car. And, um, but we're going to tamper with it um, and give people something new to talk about. So Harlan's holding the gray. Actually, the uh, round of applause really should go to Chuck and the team who brought the paint show. I can't tell you the number of people who've come up to me who bought recent cars out of the new shop and they say it's the best looking car they've ever seen from a paint perspective. Absolutely world class. It embarrasses a lot of expensive cars. Uh, it's parked next to and uh, you know, that was a huge investment over there, a huge project to get that uh, paint shop <laughs> in place. <laughs> okay, we're taking him out of the base cover. He's gonna do <laughs> an auto show model instead. <laughs> anyway, we'll let you uh, come up and take a look at these. Um, I think that's actually the end of the show. Oh, yeah, I wanted to mention the uh, the last day to order, if you say, oh my god, I can't stand those new colors, I've got to have one of the old colors. Um, well, honestly, it's too late for, for the ZR1 anyway. Um, but the last day to order on the rest of the cars, uh, the current uh, Watkins Gray is May uh, 17th. And uh, we'll be producing the car new color August 6th. And then for the blue, last day to order June 28th. And uh, we'll start production October 1st, so a little more time on the blue if you want your ad. So thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the teamwork and willingness to go the extra mile to bring us some panels. We can put these outside in the sun, people can take a look at them. Okay. All right. Awesome.
Okay, I think that uh, wraps it up. Yeah. Traditionally, have a manual standard, and, 
in the uh, you know, and I, it, be, be, be extra, and I think most people think of that as kind of a pr more premium because it does more for you. And now that we have the you know with the towel shifting, you're kind of getting two trains this into one. But it's an interesting question. Yeah. Sure Historically, yeah. though, the reason it's been that way is the automatic transmission costs a lot more than the manual, and so it would be a really bad decision to give away the expensive one and then try to charge money. Most people would object if we tried to charge for the manual when so long for so long. It's been standard. They say, well, that should be a zero cost option, right? Or we actually get money back if I do the manual because we taught people to do that. So for us, that would be a really bad business strategy. A lot has been talked about with um, the attention to detail with the new paint shop. Maybe Chuck can address, you know, a lot of orange peel questions have been asked before. The two panels do look fantastic, so can you talk a little bit about the attention you guys put into the process and the new process plus orange peel? Sure, sure. lack thereof. Sure. I think, I think really kind of a twofold answer. I mean, one, when we upgraded the shop, uh, if we would have just built I'm going to say what our normal build of process paint shop is. We just put one in Flint, Michigan. Okay, so if we would have put that paint shop here, we would have improved the appearance of the car over the current paint shop based on the technology changes that are in new shops versus the old one that we had uh, used to have. What made it go from that to the quantum leap forward is this paint shop is not. A standard paint shop there is this is radically different than the one we just built in Flint and it was built to optimize competing composite materials because this is a it's a great surface or a great substrate for design to make it light and the shape you want but honestly it's a terrible canvas for us to paint so what we did is knowing that and knowing this is what the car is made of we optimized the process to accommodate this right so um, there's a lot of things that we did in that. We, it takes us a lot longer to process a car in our new shop because we paint it much slower. We bake it at lower temperatures. We bake it longer than what we used to at, at those lower temperatures. And then we did a few things that are kind of proprietary that I'm not gonna tell you what we did that were to optimize to deal with this, right? Because this is a really tough substrate. So it's kind of a twofold answer. You've got a lot of bump with just being new, but then we made it specifically to deal with composites. Okay, um, so the standard car comes with the low wing. That's actually the top speed car. So it has lower drag. So that's the car that we tested and went 212 miles an hour. Uh, the high wing car trades as always, just like a race car. You trade some drag to get more downforce. Uh, top speed of that car is just a little over 200. Um, I don't think we have like back to back lap times if that's what you're looking for. Cause there's, it's, you know, the tires are a huge part of that. The arrow is a giant part of that. Um, but there's a pretty big track differential. Uh, on the street, honestly, you're not going to see a, a huge difference. Does that answer your question, or was it you're looking for something more specific? Yeah, okay. All right, we had another one over here. Question, is there a difference in the top speed of the convertible and the coupe? And the answer is yes. Uh, the shape of the convertible is not as streamlined as the coupe. You know, it has that teardrop upper, we call it, the, the greenhouse of the car. Top speed of the convertible is 208. Um, that's with the top up. We haven't had the guts to test it. <laughs> I'm sorry, say again. The Z07 package, is that still available in the Z06? Absolutely, yes. Question is, is Z07 still available on Z06? Yes, it is. Z06 is unchanged. We haven't tampered with it at all. Right behind it, the yellow line. Hi there, I'm from Europe. Um, I live here, but I have a lot of friends back in Europe who are very disappointed they can't buy the car legally in Europe. Can you explain the thought process behind not making it available and what makes it not available? Um, the question is, why aren't we selling a ZR1 in Europe? Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons, actually. Uh, Europe has a bunch of different regulations, 
uh, that we don't have. Um, one of them is pedestrian protection. So there's a requirement that uh, if you hit a pedestrian and their head bounces off the hood, you have to protect them. Uh, that means that most cars need about three inches air gap between the engine and the hood. Um, that's one of the reasons if you look at cars globally, if you look at cars like 10 years ago, the fronts are more streamlined. They've gotten truckier and truckier. The, the nose has come up, and that's a big reason for that. Um, there's a lot of other uh, regulations. One of them is forward and down vision. Uh, when you're at your seated height, there's a European regulation that the top of the hood can't see at a certain height, four degree down. Uh, I was talking about how we wanted to push the engine as high as possible. So uh, that's another place where Europe would have compromised uh, this car. Another one is export radii. So in Europe, again, for pedestrian protection, they require a whole exterior surface to have really generous radii, so nothing is sharp. If you look at our uh, top level aero package, we have, uh, you know, for aerodynamics, you don't want big, thick panels. You want very thin panels. So our end plates on our splitter are uh, nice and thin. They wouldn't meet uh, export compliance. Europe requires, uh, you can only have lead in the battery, nowhere else on the car. So you can have 60 pounds of lead in the battery, but you can't have lead anywhere else. The most robust main bearings in the world have a very tiny amount of lead in it and really good lubricity. Makes the engine more robust on track. We didn't want to give that up. Um, so there's really a whole suite of uh, reasons, things that we could optimize around the car if we didn't take it to Europe. And it would have been, honestly, a very low volume. We're already a low volume car in Europe. This would have been a low volume variant of a low volume car, and it didn't seem right to penalize all cars around the world uh, for the tiny volume of cars. So I'm glad you live here. <laughs> right here? When, when are we going to have the uh, marshmallow option? One of the most visual images, visceral images of the ZR1 is that 12 inch blue flame shooting out the exhaust at full throttle. <laughs> we didn't show that, that a little bit. That's, that's, that comes standard. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard, he's making reference to the pictures that are out there of the ZR1 with a blue flame coming out of the exhaust about that far. Um, that does happen on track cars to be really warm. You have to get it really warm, run hard for a while, and you won't see it during the day. It's only in dust conditions uh, that you see it, but you do see uh, fuel being burned off. And it can, it's pretty impressive. It's pretty cool. <laughs> right here. With the uh, proprietary technology that you're talking about, the paint now, uh, if someone were to have a boo-boo, with their beloved car. Uh, is that going to make it more challenging for your average automotive repair shop to match the paint? I think uh, a lot of them have trouble currently matching. <laughs> but when you do things in, in painting, you know, like we build 100, 116 cars a day right now is what we build in 10 hours, right? And so when you're repainting a individual car, if you wanted to repaint this, that's a totally different process anyway than what we use to paint a car, 116 of them a day. Um, they don't use the same paints as we do. They don't bake the car at the same temperature as we do, right? Because your whole car is put together. You can't subject it to the same level of, of temperatures that we do when we're painting just the panel set. So recoating is a total different uh, process than what we use. Um, but if done correctly, right, more by a professional shop, um, it, it'll look good. I mean, you can see cars and, and uh, that people have had custom painted, and they have a really good paint job on them, right? So you just have to find the right people to do it. But it's it's a total different process when I repaint versus what we do is as an original. Correct, because they use different paint than us. We did change the paint chemistry for the shop. As I mentioned, we bake at a lower temperature. Um, but they're using different paint even than, than we are, because they're even significantly lower, since you can't subject the car to that heat again. So the way I would interpret it is a really good shop can get to the same result without using the exact same technique that we do in the plant. 
takes them a lot longer, right? I gotta build 116 of these today, <laughs> they gotta fix year one, right? Yeah. So that's that's a big difference. How about the back? We haven't heard from the back. Is that you, Frank? That's me. Um, now that you guys have done well with a few tracks for the land of the AOR, and you guess you made it like go to other well known American tracks, maybe on a loop or something, setting some more records. Um, that sounds like the question is, do we have an intent to go extend our track record to other tracks? Actually, not really. The, the records we broke were kind of inadvertent, and we don't have this big corporate plan, hey, let's go take the ACR's records at all the places they did. Honestly, we can't afford to do that. You know, we're, we've got enough on our plate as it is. So, um, you know, there probably will be additional track records here and there, but it'll, it'll become just because we're there for some other reason. That's, that's not going to be a mission of ours. Here. Let's shove it out.
right there. We took advantage of that downtime too, not just to tie in the paint shop, but if you, some of you, I think, were in Kai's presentation yesterday, we showed you some footage of inside the facility. We did other upgrades while we were, while we were down. So we put in a new scale line, for example, and made other modifications that we simply couldn't do when, when we were running. So we took advantage of that time. Yes, right here. problem with the magnetic ride update and he said that he would contact the zone manager uh, the GM zone manager in our area because he's heard from a couple others and we just went through a big deal so okay. I highly so, recommend that everybody talk with Jeff so okay. we can really get it out because some of the dealers you know it's $350 to buy it and the installation is free and there's all kinds of code numbers for that some of the dealers are trying to charge $400 to put it in. It's insane, so thank you. you know, we hear stories like that all the time. So Jeff, sounds like Jeff has already been talking about it at this event, so yeah, if, if you can't find Jeff, get a hold of one of us and we'll text him or something and, and bring him to you. So thanks. Yes, right here. Depends the way you're ordering. Um, I don't know, do you know? If you order a car next week, how long does it take to get a car if you order it now? Well, the, big, the, the biggest question you have is, is the dealership have the allocation that you want? Are you talking zero one specific or any corner? Any corner? Right, so, okay, so the, the dealer has a the key thing is to ask your dealership, make sure they have an allocation for a four bed order. That's the big thing, because otherwise you'll have to wait for that. But assuming they do for a grand score, I think it's about six to eight weeks usually. Uh, your car, so it shouldn't take too long. You have a question? You have a question? Uh, I don't have a question. Oh, I thank you for putting together the uh, upgrade on the suspension, and thank you for building the C7, which is truly a life changing car. Thank you. I understand you've built 746 ZR1s. I think it's 200 Seven. something. I not 700, no. That's our um, old order. I showed her what it's, it's. It's not all those have been built yet. That's kind of what's in our order bank. Order bank. Uh, so that's yeah, ours that have been built. That's what's in our, our order bank that have already been accepted to be built. My question is, do you know what the number of built ZR1s are since March 5th? Approximately 300, I think. I think it's somewhere around 300. Okay. So if we're building this ZR1 from now until August of next year? We haven't announced any kind of endpoint for it. At 300, you said 300 for 10 months, that's 3,000? Right now, we could, if you're asking what rate Are you asking or telling? <laughs> I'm asking. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. You built 300, so I'm trying to get an estimate of, because I heard numbers on ZR1s were going to be limited, but if you've already built 300, Ten more months, that would be three thousand. It's not a limited run model. It's not yeah. like it's you get number thirty-five out of two thousand or three thousand. We're going to build as many as we can. We are capacity constrained. All that carbon, most of that carbon is hand laid up, just like a race shop does it. And so we can only build forty odd uh, cars a week. And so that constraint is going to be with us. Um, but we're not going to stop producing. We'll produce as many as we can through the rest of the life cycle. Because the salespeople I've spoken to have said they've got a lot more orders than they have allocations, so I'm just trying to understand, is there any way to help these dealers get more yeah. allocations or whatever? Well, that's a good, good question. The question is the dealers say they have more orders and allocations. We did put out uh, them allocations, but that's kind of a, it's not the, that's not for the entire model year. That's like the first round, whatever. So there will be some more coming down the road. But it is, again, very limited, so I invite people that, in, in terms of how many we can build per week, and so it, it is going to end up, you know, in the 2,000-ish range, you know, depending on an annual on, basis. That's the on an annual basis. For, and that's for everybody. For weeks. Yeah. So we, and we, and it has been a big, big success so far, so that's a good thing, but if you're trying to get one, I advise people not to. Don't wait too long. Don't wait too long. 
you have something else? ZR1 manual transmission. I don't know any constraints. No constraint. Right now, automatic only. No constraints on transmissions for ZR1. We'll double check. As far as I know, there's no. You want a manual? I'll say it green, no, there's no constraints. So if you want a manual, get a manual. If the dealer had an allocation, it wouldn't matter whether or not it was, uh, unless there was a constraint out there, or they wouldn't get so many no. automatics versus manuals, so. No, we can, we can flex to whatever people decide to buy. Okay. Any more over here? Yes, no more. Um, like I said, you know, direct injection is a very high pressure uh, injection system. And there was no uh, pump in the world anywhere that would deliver the pressures we need at the volume we needed. So there's an absolute ceiling on the amount of fuel that you can get into the engine uh, on that basis. So you had the biggest pump we could get. Uh, it's above 4,000 RPM when you got your foot all the way in it. So it's very high power levels in it comes in. So you have to be really moving. Uh, you mean at peak? I don't know the exact you know, what percentage of fuel. Uh, if I, I'm guessing here, but I would say it's something like 30% would be port driven once you get to 100% direct injection. Um, there may be somebody else who has that exact number in their head. I don't know. And I'm guessing that based on how short I knew we were with direct injection home. More? Yes, over here. Um, it was just one of our development engineers, uh, actually two development engineers. And if you looked at the inset picture, you could see they were kind of bored. There wasn't much going on. You know, they're taking data. Um, the driver, very calm hands on the wheel of the car. It's really easy to drive at speed. And so even though they were like this far away from the guardrail, um, it's kind of a non-event. So. Yeah, I mean, we, we do take all the safety precautions. That's why they have uh, driver suits on that were in helmets. You know, we'd be as careful as we can be. You don't know what's going to happen. But really, in terms of driving skill, doesn't take it. I shouldn't say that. I just insulted her about it. <laughs> Even I can do it. Yes. So speaking of no driving skill, Jay Leno can do that. Uh, how many people have seen the little clip of Jay? That was uh, filmed last fall. Um, he keeps in close contact with our team. When I say our team, I mean the whole GM team, uh, looking for opportunities to showcase our products that also are synergistic with whatever themes they have for the show. Um, they asked us last summer, um, do you have anything coming that might you know, be good for a show we're doing? And they well, we got something coming you might be interested in. Um, so their shooting schedule required that it be done uh, last fall. Um, they're really good on like some media outlets. They're really good at keeping embargoes. So we told them you have to, we can't show anything until after we do our media reveals. Um, so they're really good about that. But yeah, Jay showed up and he spent the whole day at our proving grounds. Uh, we oriented him on our circle track, our five mile continuous, it's a perfect circle, uh, high bank uh, walls. And so, uh, you know, it's, he's driven a lot of fast cars uh, in his day, and so 200 wasn't that that much of a big deal to him. Uh, I rode shotgun, and I don't know what they're going to show on the show. Actually, I haven't seen all I've seen is that, that little clip. Uh, he was easily able, very comfortably able to drive the car over 200 miles an hour. The only thing that was a little disconcerting is once we were done and he was slowing down, he was still doing 190, and he started doing lane changes. He started going back and forth like this, which is something development engineers do to check turn in and stabil chassis stability, but not normally 190. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only thing that gave me pause. But he's, he, he's a good driver, and if you watch his show regularly, he does crazy stuff, and going 200 in a ZR1 is probably the least crazy thing he's, he's done. Yes? Yeah. So I have a two-part question. Um, first, talk about the gear ratio. Can you speak to some of the, the 
you guys had to support all of the horsepower that the LG5 makes? Okay, uh, the answer is yes, the ratios are the same. Uh, they're quite optimal for a car and uh, this horsepower. Um, there's um, a lot of engineering challenges. Um, I went through some of them, you know, how to keep the car cool, how to keep the car planted on the ground, uh, how to develop the chassis around it, and I've talked about some of the other things that you have to do with the chassis. Uh, to, that's all done specifically around the engine, so things like traction control, launch control, when you have that much more torque, uh, you have to recalibrate everything. Even if you have the same tires, you're uh, recalibrating that. You know, executing this much carbon fiber on a car, trying to take as much weight out of it as possible uh, is a big challenge. And when you have cars that go over 200 miles an hour, all that aero stuff I was talking about, that's really a safety thing. It's not just time around the track. It's all about stability and speed. It's all about uh, making sure the car is very manageable, easy to drive, and safe. So almost everywhere you look around the car, there's some kind of uh, technical challenge. Even just having a convertible uh, that goes that fast, you have to worry about, you know, is the top itself robust enough not to, to be able to stand the wind buffeting? There's a lot of loads uh, on a car when you're going that fast. I was thinking more of the drive line because 715 foot pounds of torque is a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so you're asking about the drive line? I was thinking more of the drive line tank. Um, actually, most of the drive line held up pretty well, and the reason is um, most of the load cases that really test the drive line aren't related to steady state torque. So even though the steady state torque is high, most of the drive line designs are driven by abuse load cases. So things like sidestepping the clutch at uh, red line or, or overrunning the clutch, letting the engine drop down to idle, then sidestepping the clutch or a launch where on a sticky surface where you get power hop, where it's sticking and slipping. It's those kind of spike loads that actually drive the design. And those are all based on the inertia. I'm sorry, I'm probably boring some of you with a technical answer, but those loads are driven by the inertia. So the inertia of the tire wheel assembly uh, and the inertia of the engine, uh, and those are relatively unchanged. They're almost exactly the same. So the fact that the engine has more torque on a steady state, like in a dyno kind of test, or a continuous run, like when you're accelerating, like in a quarter mile run, that's actually not stressing the drive line much at all. Thank you. Any more? Are we done? Okay, well, we'll be around uh, all day if you have questions to think of later. I want to thank you guys. and being part of the Corvette community. You know, if it wasn't for all our customers, we wouldn't even have jobs to do. So we really, really appreciate it. And uh, please bring any other input you have or questions uh, up to us. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Tash.